As I open this video, I feel the only true course of action is to be truthful. Trying to figure out what I want to do next on the channel since the end of October has been hard. And it's not because there aren't things I could cover, it's because I've come to terms lately with just how much I cannot produce a video unless my heart is entirely in it. I have to be passionate, I have to believe, I have to care. Otherwise, it feels like pulling teeth just to work on it. Lately, I haven't quite had that spark that makes me excited to sit down and write a script. October, I did get it, because October is always excellent and I can tear free a little bit and do some special things. But altogether, it has been rough. More or less, it's been along the lines of what I described in my Marble Hornets Explain Retrospective video. And while thinking about it, I cannot deny what I have felt a serious pull towards on my own for a few months now, wishing I had clearance to dedicate my efforts there without worry. But I kept putting it off and trying to look elsewhere, because Nightmind has always been heavily focused on internet-based content. But the other day, I took a chance and rolled the dice, asking you guys on Twitter how you felt about the idea of me covering offline things and content beyond internet-based works or mysteries. And you supported me in an overwhelming response, making something very clear. If I care about it, then at the very least, you're willing to take a look and support the fact that I took the time to do a video. And that, to me, is a blessing, especially at this time. I suppose it's just been kind of stifling myself, hasn't it, to focus only on my usual wheelhouse with the exception of October videos. A lot of awesome and inspiring stuff comes from online, but so much of what gets produced online is inspired by things found without a computer. Web series, ARGs, internet story projects. It's only a corner of what I'm capable of talking about. And if something gets me fired up enough that a desire to make a big long video about it won't leave me alone, that should be enough of a sign. So, thank you, all of you, for being here, and supporting, and letting me know you're not just here waiting for me to talk about whatever 50 people just bugged Rainbot about, or that you only subscribe so I could explain Pets Cup when there's finally enough storyline to appropriately do so. It's a good feeling, a freeing feeling, and it lets me know I can do something with my passion where I have felt it instead of feeling guilty that it's not about this web series, or this ARG, or some hot new creepy game that's making the Let's Player circuit. There's going to be evolution here now. I have journeys I want to undertake and topics I want to talk about and explore beyond YouTube videos and cryptic Twitter messages. That doesn't mean I'm going to stop. This is still Nightmind's foundation. I just feel like the house needs a new addition or some new furniture to bring some life and excitement back into the place, you know? Something to make it a little bit more interesting around here. A bit of variety. I'm going to need some time to dig in and do this properly. It involves heavy research and note-taking, as well as whatever filming I can do that's appropriate. But for this moment, and this month, I wanted to get the ball rolling in a really unconventional way and exercise some self-indulgence in realizing I'm not as restricted as I held myself to being. YouTubers do watch YouTube. It's our environment, not just our office building. Something you will find, though, is that a lot of us don't watch our peers in the field as a majority. You run the risk of cross-contamination of content and thoughts about coverage you might do on the same topic, and you just don't want to oversaturate yourself with more work-related things in your off time. Even titans of their field with long-running history have interests that they can't help but bring up. None of us are one-note creatures. Quite often we start our channels because of those we watch and the inspiration they bring us, even when those channels have nothing to do with what we specialize in. Tonight, I would like to give thanks to those channels that have been my go-to content providers, my favorite YouTube creators, as well as some whom I'm lucky enough to call friends. It gives me a chance to celebrate them. It's an idea that excites me enough to make a video, and it will also satisfy a bit of curiosity some of you have expressed. Just what do I watch on YouTube anyway? Our first spotlight comes with a bit of history, and it's quite a sentimental sort of thing for me. Before I began working on Night Minds, I actually had an interest in webcomics and thought the idea was fascinating. It really won't come as a surprise to most of you, I think. It's the same concept as web series, really. Creators with big ideas for stories and projects using the internet as their means of distribution, circumventing big industry and going straight to the people while being in full control of their work and all of its aspects. It was a novel idea and felt like a territory of complete freedom and creativity with all the good and bad that comes with that privilege. On YouTube, there were a good amount of printed comic book reviewers, but there was only one webcomic reviewer. Riser, the webcomic relief. 
I was still on the fence about YouTube even being an option for my own creativity and expression when I found the webcomic relief, and I can thank Riser for being the one to push me off the fence and onto the action side of the field, even though he didn't know it. The webcomic relief began in 2010 with coverage of a comic called Bizarre Uprising. Watching it now, it's funny to think about how much Riser's environment and format has changed, while he himself has always been the same great guy. He's learned a lot of new tricks along the way with humor and critique, but eight years back, I see the same riser that I met three years ago and still know today. Back when he started, he had the typical YouTuber starter kit. Microphone with background buzz, compact digital camera, and a computer desk place in the corner of his bedroom. The format is far stronger now than it used to be, but you see the foundation in it as described by riser here. Different segments to tackle each layer of what makes a comic, with final critique at the end and the transition between each segment is punctuated with a title card and a bit of music. There are good comics, there are bad comics, and then there's horrible comics. And I want to review them all. And I want to review the comics you suggest. So, starting today, I will review a webcomic called Bizarre Uprising. So you can sort of get the idea of what this new program is going to be. The webcomic belief has four sections. Art, story, characters, and the final verdict. So, without further ado, let's begin with the story. Riser used to have a laid-back, urban, funk, hip-hop bit of feeling. That kind of music you associate with images of graffiti in a New York alleyway. And while it doesn't seem like the type of thing that goes hand-in-hand -hand with webcomics, it really did set him apart and helped establish an identity while breaking away a sense you'd get from looking at all these other comic reviewers on YouTube. I don't even need to say it, do I? <laughs> you know the atmosphere you expect. Just imagine a fedora and the smell of someone's basement, and yeah, you know. Riser, however, was cool, and he wasn't even trying to be. The man was just authentic, and you felt it all the time. One of Riser's best hallmarks for commentary is how flawlessly he slides between explaining the narrative, genuine critique, and then a stinger joke that highlights a critique of the work without even having to spell it out for the viewer. It never failed to put a smile on my face. This piece is from that very first video eight years ago on Bizarre Uprising. And that's pretty much it. That, that's what it actually starts out as. And it's working sort of good. It's goofy, but it, it, it's, it's laughable. But then suddenly it takes a stark turn and that should just have been avoided. To sum up, Mito is a vampire and he gets his chest pains because he doesn't drink blood. But I am more worried because he's walking out in bright daylight. Now, this is some really old stock for sure, and I didn't get to it until I was well into watching the webcomic relief. When I first came across Riser, it was about... This time in 2014, I believe. Either the very end of 2014 or the winter of 2015. I distinctly remember coming across the channel around the time that Riser got a box from the UberQuest creators, which apparently was in October of 2014, and it's funny how that leaves an impression on me, because one of the biggest things for Riser about receiving that package was getting food from the United States. Okay, what the fuck is this? Uh, it's, uh, Fritos Bean Dip. The fuck? What? Bean dip, original flavor. Uh, this... Like, if you're American, this is going to be hilarious because I'm just going to take stuff you know fully well. I'm just going to be like, what the fuck is this? So, bean dip. At this time, Riser was in the middle of his longest running webcomic review series, the absolute monster known as Las Ondas. Previously, he had only done a big, crazy series on Sonichu, but the enormity of the La Salinda saga blows it out of the water and shows Riser at his finest during this period. I remember watching one or two webcomic reviews of his before this, like So, You're a Cartoonist and Caribbean Blue before diving into La Salinda's. Thinking on it now, I believe the video on So You're a Cartoonist might have been the first thing I watched by Riser, because the creator and focal point of that comic, Andrew Dobson, was already known to me as an infamous online character, and I just couldn't resist seeing a video explanation and roast of someone I knew had a history of earning a bad rep. You can continue the ad hominem in the premise section of the comic. But Riser, you bald midget of stuttering gibberish, you might say. Why would you continue the at human M in the premise section? 
And the answer is actually pretty simple. The comic is Andrew Dobson. Seriously, every comic is him doing something. Him. Not a character of sorts, no. Him. Not a made up persona with uncanny similarities. Nope. It's all Andrew Dobson. Inserting yourself into a comic to make yourself shine like a hero. Just, just, just go away, please. Good. Now, some people might claim, well, that's not so bad. It could be a cartoony avatar sharing his likeness. And that's until you read the shit underneath his comics, which are always a follow up to what happens on the page. I swear I've lost count of how many times I've read this really happened under the comic. That clip right there captures the strongest impression I've had of the webcomic relief from the early days, and I don't know if Riser understood how impactful his choices and setup were. Yes, he's at his computer desk again, but now he's in his own apartment, and it's a very unique, very styled, very different apartment that has a lot of character and this wonderfully welcoming at-home feeling. Every time I've ever seen Riser's place in a video, I've wished I could actually look around inside, because it's the kind of home that has an atmosphere you can feel through the video. This kind of place, mixed with Riser's content creation, personality, and humor, sold me immediately on the webcomic relief. You see, it's not just the standard video work he does and the content he rips into that brought me in and kept me. It's the actual atmospheric feeling he created through his work. Even while seeing comic panels float in front of your face, you still have a mental image of the environment and all the associated feelings. There have even been times where, unknowingly, Riser himself recognizes it. Like, just look at this video from February 1st, 2015. I remember this being a new video at the time, because the series Riser was doing was new, and I was also feeling the effects of winter. I don't know if you can tell, but it's really snowing hot outside. This is super cozy. You get to see that snow coming down through the window for the whole video as Riser digs into a webcomic in a more laid-back, train-of-thought setting. And it really is just cozy. I don't know how else to describe it. Webcomic relief has always given me a sense of this sort of thing that nothing else has. You know, I've been told by some people that my videos have an effect like that of their own. A form of transportation and atmosphere. And though I have always pushed to create that, it's never quite been something that I myself could feel, because I make the content. But I believed my viewers, because I knew it was like just from watching Riser. During this period, I was nothing more than a viewer. I was an outsider looking in, watching a YouTuber do his thing, enjoying every minute of it, living his life, and having the effects on an audience I could feel and see reflected in other commenters. There are other influences I have that push me to believe I could actually make Night Mind, but I owe most of it to Riser, especially after watching the Lost Linda series and realizing that if you care about a subject enough and put on a good enough show, it doesn't matter how many videos it takes or how long each one is. Your audience will find you, and they will enjoy your content instead of dismissing it just from looking at the runtime. The Lost Linda series was so good and so hysterical that I ended up watching it twice, once on my own, and then once with a friend, because he needed to experience this too. I even ended up recommending Riser to another friend who became a subscriber and caught up on the stuff I had watched. I mean, it even includes the Los Lindis suicide drinking game, in which there are only two rules. Whenever something is super sexy for no reason, you take a shot. And also, prepare your coffin and write your will now. The results in episode 1 alone are fantastic. New rule. Every time I point out that Mora is our protagonist in disbelief, take a shot. Mora instead seduces Miles, who just happens to come by. Also, take a shot. While seducing Miles, you are treated to her just calling Miles all sorts of stuff. My favorite being selfish. Mora then takes Miles to her room and humps the ever-living crap out of him, all while thinking that he's a loser and that he'd never make it this far with someone as good as her. And all of this is just to tell Minos just what he's missing out on. It's also gonna be said that we're seeing less skin on Mora while she's having sex than when she's just out walking about. Also, you can't make someone jealous if they don't care about you. Holy testicle, Tuesday, what the... <coughs> 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 I think that's all I can say for this time.
And it's not just funny, either. Riser knows of what he speaks. He's insightful, intelligent, well-researched, and very fair. His barbs are going to sting when he throws them. Boy, are they going to sting. But if you get hit with one, you deserved it. I owe a lot of confidence in the idea that I could do my thing with web series and ARGs to Riser's ability to show how it can not only work, but be done to an awesome degree. If you know the reputation of some webcomics too, but haven't read them, believe me when I tell you, they're in here. And you'll also be shown some things that you've never heard of, both terrible and awesome. Riser is proud to celebrate the heroes of the scene and unafraid to tackle its villains, even if some can be very, very messed up. Just a bit of knowledge for you all before we begin. Riser releases each webcomic relief review as an episode of a season, and each season has a meta story arc to it that includes beginning and ending skits, which you've seen just a touch of here. Don't be confused. It's all a bit of Riser having his own fun with YouTuber storytelling outside the main content, like I do in my October videos. And on that note, don't be surprised to hear a familiar voice once in a while, or hear a name drop. Riser is a personal friend now, and has been since the beginning of Nightmind. I was a patron of his when I first began, and actually pledged enough for his end of video shoutouts back when I was only just rolling out the Marble Hornets Explained series. Which, funny enough, it turned out that he was a fan of. Telling him exactly what it was I was doing, and what I wanted for the shoutout, prompted conversations and we became friends based off of that. <laughs> I'm lucky enough to say that one of my major inspirations and favorite channels also turned out to be my very first friend on YouTube, and still is today. If you end up liking the webcomic relief as much as I do, definitely see if you can add to the Patreon. Riser deserves all the support he gets and more, and has never stopped making videos. At the beginning of this month, he released a new review on Lakara's old webcomic, Lightbringer. He's got a major backlog of great content, he's still uploading today, and I know he'll keep going into the future. Definitely take a look. This is a creator who helped me become Nick Nocturne and come up with Nightmind. Alright everybody, it's Juice and Jam time. Yeah! <laughs> you knew this one was coming. Oh man, who's gonna be number one? Pan Pizza's Rebel Taxi is a channel I've been watching just as long as I've been watching the webcomic Relief, but is also a channel that covers so much mainstream media protected by giant companies that if I were to show you a bunch of clips from Pan's videos, I'd get curb stomped by YouTube's automated systems. Okay, let's do this quick before Viacom catches me making a video under criticism and fair use. To be quite honest, I have no idea how Pan manages to keep his videos from being crushed by Content ID all the time. I can only assume it's a blood pact with whatever unholy being helped Viacom keep MTV alive past 2012. But that's a mystery for another day. Rebel Taxi is the best channel on YouTube for coverage of cartoons and animation. Yeah, I said it. Pan Pizza wins the fight, alright? Don't even try to enter the competition, mister. Because this beta male is the real alpha show. No one has as much humor or basement dwelling buddy charisma as Pan and nobody lives their life for animation and their interests as much as he does. His room alone is a museum of everything Pan Pizza and Rebel Taxi, a complete reflection of his channel and coverage. He is also the most absolutely consistent YouTube channel I have ever seen. I can always rely on Pan to upload on Tuesday, whether it's the Pizza Party podcast or a new video he's made. And while also delighting me, it puts me to absolute shame, because I could never pull that off. Pan, stop being so consistent. You make me feel horrible about my upload frequency. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it is hard to be a YouTuber whose upload content is entirely made through a microphone in Premiere Pro, because it can be extremely time-consuming to get all of your elements polished, collected, and put together. But Pan, he knocks it out of the park all the time at a pace I could only hope to match. And speaking of visual elements, Rebel Taxi's style is constantly present. His aesthetic is very strong, an incredibly comfortable and immediately recognizable template showcasing the material. And Pan always gets his material. The man has to download more video clips and images than I do, and I can only guess, painfully, how much of a chore it is to clean up his working folders. Those folders are also filled to the brim with old commercials and channel bumpers that will immediately bring you back in time and give you a feeling of sitting on the couch at night after dinner. Pan is the master of activating your nostalgia when it comes to the realm of cartoons and video games, and it's a miracle he even finds so much of what he's got. 
Every video ends with an old commercial or video clip related to the content, as if Rebel Taxi was a TV show itself that just wrapped up to make way for the next program on the schedule. History of cartoons and games, reviews on the best and worst of all sorts of things, retrospectives, series deep dives, Pan has all of it. And even creator interviews like the time he sat down with John Dilworth, the creator of Courage the Cowardly Dog. There's also an interview with Maxwell Adams, who made The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy. Rebel Taxi has always been an inspiration of mine and an absolute favorite. There are a lot of similarities between this channel and the webcomic relief, Pan Pizza and Riser, but there are also quite a few key differences. Both of them, however, really did a lot to inform me of what somebody was capable of on YouTube and inspired me to reach for my own version of that kind of quality and production. To be as visually sharp as Pan Pizza, as analytical as Riser, as atmosphere-inducing and engaging as both, and as inspiring as both in the content they cover and the way they convey their emotions about it. I wanted all of that. I felt such a need to be that in my own way. And I can really give credit to Riser and Pan for unknowingly, helping mold me into who I am and what Nightmind is, from its beginning to the current evolution. I've even been lucky enough to be on the Pizza Party podcast, which was like a dream come true after being such a long-time listener. I'd often work on a new video while listening to the podcast. My main monitor would have my programs open for editing, and on the other, I'd have the Pizza Party going. The same goes for a lot of Pan's regular uploads. I think the funniest thing about the channels I watch regularly now or have been watching since before Nightmind is how many of their creators have become friends, or are people I can reach out and say hello to. It's weird, but it's exhilarating. Speaking of, here's a guy who has run in the same circles as me and around the same people so often by accident that we would have met each other five more times if the first didn't happen. Frederick Knudsen, creator of Down the Rabbit Hole. There is exactly one key difference between me and Fred when it comes to content, really. I cover weird stories that are not real, and he covers weird stories that are. Down the Rabbit Hole is like the perfect mini-documentary series on tales of twisted people, odd events, and internet histories and personalities that went <laughs> down a rabbit hole. For every one of my case files on some forgotten or undiscovered ARG or web series, Fred has a video to match about some e-celebrity or infamous online persona people don't know about or whose history they never learned. He also covers subjects that, in general, interest him and inspire him to make a video. Which actually helps me realize that maybe I'm not so wrong in thinking about covering similar territory to what I've shown you all, even if it's not online content. That's part of Fred's power as a content creator. It doesn't matter what he's talking about because his intrigue is always an indicator of taste and enjoyment factor. If he talks about it, there was an element that made him care enough to make a video. And if he makes a video, he's going to make sure it's as enjoyable as his own appreciation of the subject. I cannot tell you how often Fred was recommended to me as a peer whose content I needed to check out leading up to him and I talking. It was practically every week. And I can tell you now, he is one of my best friends, and I know him well enough to tell you that he is a perfectionist, which is why his videos feel the way they do, and why it takes a bit of time for new stuff to come out. Fred is one of the only content creators that can relate to me on how awful and tedious the process of getting audio made, adjusted, and syncing it up to visuals can be. It really doesn't matter what Fred covers, like I said. I know judging from his interest and his production, I'm up for whatever he gets into. Fred is a natural storyteller and has that strong documentarian bend to his voice and flow. And when he's not quite satisfied with his results, even when they're already good, he'll keep working at it. He has a whole extension video for the Final Fantasy house that puts together a visual timeline of events, just in case you couldn't follow along for the main video. That is dedication. My next few highlights are dedicated in different ways, mainly in that they just never stop uploading and blow me, Pan, Fred, and most channels out of the water for pumping out videos. Here's a big surprise for you on my list. Quite. The floating hoodie who goes into the truly scary parts of YouTube and the internet, where not even I dare to venture. The realm of big name vloggers, vidcon stars, TikTok videos, and memes. Quite. Loves. Memes. But what is Quiet? Judging by everything we know about Quiet, I suspect he is an SCP in containment, unlike myself because I still managed to evade the SCP Foundation's reach. Quiet's anomalous effect is the power to create videos that are all about 10 minutes long, but always feel, somehow, like they're 15 to 20 minutes and all come with the potato chip effect. You can't have just one. If you watch a Quiet video, you will end up watching all Quiet videos. 
You will be lost in the potato chip bag of meme topics, stupid news from Twitter, the latest drama about whatever ass clown member of the Paul family is acting out now, channels that baffle quite senses and somehow have over a million subscribers, crazy things that happen to YouTube, channels on it, websites, and apps, and occasionally whatever is on Quite's mind, like that time he hated clocks. Lately, he's been expanding into odd new territory, like the TikTok app and, uh, non-aesthetic things? So guys, I did it. I wasted even more hours of my life on some bullshit. So this video is going up a decent bit after I recorded slash made it, but on the day that I'm making this, I spent like my entire morning just laying down scrolling through TikToks, and I cannot think of a single thing that is less aesthetic than that. Now before you judge me, TikTok was smart and they realized that my taste in TikTok videos is of ones that are clowning on everybody who does it unironically. So basically my entire feed was just a long line of people using the duet feature to do Fortnite emotes next to someone lip syncing to a quote from a movie about how their father beats them or something. But basically today we're going to be looking at some non-aesthetic things, courtesy of the Twitter account of the same name, at Pictures Folder, whose profile picture is a human body wrapped entirely in hair with a cigarette sticking out of where a mouth presumably is. This does not bode well. I'm barely a quarter of a page into the script and I think I've misspelled aesthetic every single time I've tried to type it out. This can only mean great oh. things for white America. <sighs> so guys, you did it. You fucking did it. You hit that 20,000 like goal and now have forced my hand. The one where I have no option to just skip the furry ones in a TikTok compilation, and instead I have to watch a compilation of just furry TikToks. My mentions on Twitter and comment section on YouTube have been nothing but filled with how much you guys want me to suffer, and how much you just wanted to push for that 20k like goal, and how close we were getting within less than 10 hours. And ever since we hit that like goal, you guys have been sending me non-stop messages and tweets and comments about how, oh my god, quite, you hit that 20k likes on the video. You you have to make the video on furry TikToks now! I know! Shut up! Oh hey, speaking of quiet and furries, I'm going to cost myself about 15% of all viewers right now by bringing this up, and I know it. But this is my party, and I will embarrass myself if I want to, damn it. I have a crazy theory, crazier even than Quite's persistent attacks on Jack's film as a master criminal with a legion of henchmen. The only reason Quite appears to be a hoodie cryptid is not because he is one for real, but because he needs to cover himself up because he is, in fact, the furry YouTuber Nas Hyena. Observe the following. Hi again guys, and more specifically to my fellow Americans, because you guys are the ones who will be able to directly relate to me with this. Hiya! Nas Hyena here! Today's video is about silent fursuiters. Hi again guys! Hiya! Hey guys, how are you all doing today? Hiya! Nas Hyena here! Hey guys! Hiya! Hi again! Hiya! And now, after hearing that voice and seeing all that movement, observe. The foreheads. The eyebrows. They both have hands. And while Quite seems to have no accent, Nas Hyena is an Australian with an accent he can disguise. This is Officer Dan Good to everyone, and if your party is making too much noise, or you're having too much fun, or you're yiffing too loudly, then you're gonna have to shut your pie hole and leave the hotel room forever, okay furry? And where was quite recently? That's right, Australia. And finally, in a video in which Nas shows off his human Sona, what is he wearing? A hoodie. Case closed. You think you could trick Nick Nocturne? Not with this many clues on the table, pal. No wonder you survived making two videos on furry TikTok cringe. Batman is Bruce Wayne. Quite is not Hyena. Oh my god, fuck- But don't worry, Quite. Your secret is safe with me. Kisses. Yay! <laughs> really though, Quiet is a channel I love and someone I'm glad to call a friend. His videos are ridiculous, intelligent, and wonderful. And he's always producing content. The guy is a riot and I'd hang with the hoodie anytime, assuming he was ever let out of the box. Maybe I'll tell the SCP Foundation I'll avoid leaking more of their files next October if they do me a solid and let Quite out for a day. You know, so he can put on his Nas Hyena suit and come with me to a furry con. The next channel will also be a bit of a surprise to you, but is one I've been following since before Nightmind once again. Mr. Matty Plays. Now, despite his channel name, Matty is not a Let's Player. He is a game reviewer and new coverage specialist, concentrated mainly on the RPG and story-driven adventure game scene and anything to do with the studios that create those games. His flagship content is about Bethesda Game Studios, Fallout, The Elder Scrolls, the highly anticipated Starfield, and some of the bigger properties that Bethesda publishes. Lately, he's been running constant coverage of Fallout 76, as you can probably imagine, but has also taken the time to dive into Red Dead Redemption 2 and talk about the direction of the company Bioware. 
Manny is my go-to guy for hearing news and impressions about Bethesda games and anything like them that I might enjoy, and I found his channel back when the news first broke about Fallout 4 being teased for E3 in 2015. I've stuck with him since then, watching all manner of news, impressions, reviews, and even episodes of the ham radio podcast that he hosts with his peers. Unlike a lot of sit-at-the-desk-and-record type of reviewers, Manny puts himself on camera constantly, doing something quite similar to Riser of the webcomic Relief, taking you into the comfortable, homey atmosphere of his bedroom and going the extra mile to convey his feelings on things. What's that, Morgana? Fallout 76 beta details, you say? It's about freaking time. Holy crap. Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today. We have so much Fallout 76 beta details to sift through. I have a lot of thoughts on them, so it's best that we just dive straight in. All this information is coming from Bethesda Net, as well as their frequently asked questions page for Fallout 76. Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today, and Microsoft had themselves a very telling weekend for the future of Xbox. So we're going to be going over all the news and announcements in the flash fashion so very quickly and then after that i'm going to be giving my thoughts on microsoft and the next generation i've seen a lot of think pieces on microsoft and they're going to totally take over the industry i want to discuss whether or not that's possible and true but first announcements and news microsoft acquired both obsidian entertainment and in exile entertainment <laughs> Crackdown 3 is releasing on February 15th, 2019. Hey, that's a great belated Valentine's gift for your lovers of Xbox. Can you think of any one-man game news channels who have this much energy and personality? I sure can't. Manny doesn't just come across as a YouTuber. He comes across as a fan, or that co-worker in the electronics department who actually does know everything for sale and can direct any mother or father to the game or console that their kid actually wants for Christmas. Manny's enjoyment of what he does and what he covers is every bit as evident as his professionalism in delivering the news and his thoughts. He's mature and respectful, but he's still going to tell you what he's thinking in layman's terms and attitude. And the elements of being a fan are always balanced with his elements as a video journalist and critic. It just feels more comfortable, relatable, and enjoyable to watch Maddie as opposed to other options for coverage, which can be too professional sometimes, distant, stiff, or just unenthusiastic. Matty, much like Riser, is the approachable YouTube guy. The same goes for my next two channels who deal in games but are Let's Players primarily, John Wolf and Mr. Craven. I introduced both of them for a few reasons, but mostly for the fun fact that these dudes are friends and have collaborated before. Mr. Craven and John Wolf are both horror game enthusiast Let's Players, specializing in a lot, and I mean a lot of indie titles. They'll play the games that have just come out by someone who hasn't made anything before, the stuff that no one has heard of, and sometimes the really big name things that everyone is hearing about. That being said, they each end up playing a lot of hilariously bad games. Once in a while, they find an excellent piece, but to be honest, it's much more entertaining when the game is terrible. You can discover a lot of cool things through John and Craven. For instance, they're both part of the reason that I know and enjoy Puppet Combo, the developer I highlighted in my Halloween Candy Bowl this year. John also has quite a playlist on the Rusty Lake series of games for those who like Dark Wonderland puzzles. Both of the guys give their opinions on the games they play and really think about it, and being constant players of the same kind of material, they know of what they speak. If you want more critical breakdowns of things played, John Wolf will supply, but it's fun to see the different reactions and thoughts that each has when they play the same title. What I love about the approach they both have in picking up new and untouched games is that they not only give new things a chance and provide them a window of opportunity to be shown to an audience, they run a wide variety of pieces that all provide different atmospheres, feelings, and ideas. You get 3D games, third-person games, first-person games, side-scrollers, pixelated games, retro throwback looks, haunted woods, mystery mansions, and sometimes even the weirdness of unexplainable hit mobile games. What's really fun is seeing a game end up on either channel first and gets picked up by other bigger channels. You get to smile knowing you caught on early, and so did these guys. It's just fun to be ahead of the big wave of attention sometimes. I often put on John or Craven when I'm working or eating. Great form of side screen entertainment and experiencing what's new in horror and dark indie games through osmosis. Occasionally, I'll dig into the archives of old stuff or look at a new playlist and marathon some games. If you're looking for a deep well of horror games that no one has seen, especially hilariously bad and underrated stuff, check out John Wolf or Mr. Craven for sure. My final recommendation is one that I'm sure a lot of you actually will already know, especially because one of his series has been suggested to me as something I need to look into for Nightmind. Brutal Moose Ian of Brutal Moose is the kind of funny that doesn't need to try to be funny or even change his tone of voice or pace. 
He's that kind of calmly says it funny that you can find in some people, and his video edits make all the points of humor hit better. Brutal Moose as a channel is a bit hard to pin down. It's not quite a review channel, not quite a weird food channel. It's pretty much just Ian enjoying whatever he's into and sharing his experience and explorations with us. Brutal Moose is like... Imagine going over to an entertainment center or the computer desk or even turning on the TV in 2002. Take something from inside, open the case or box, slide out the VHS tape, put it on, go into the kitchen, open the freezer, pull out whatever is the most recognizable or colorful frozen meal, and toss it in the oven or microwave. The result of your adventure going through whatever you've taken ends up as the content of a Brutal Moose video. It's very cozy, but in a strange, welcome to the American home and what we used to do here kind of way. It's nostalgic, but not too deep into the past. It's mixing the idea of recording YouTube videos with making the best of your situation when you were dropped off at your cousin's house for the day at age 10. The series on Brutal Moose that got a lot of you to suggest him to me is different from most of the channel, though. Televoid is equal parts one-man viewing party and video review, focused on the oldest home TV and VHS content that can be found. It all takes place in what feels like... Well, a television-controlled void, where Ian is stuck trying to survive whatever's on the tube. And yes, it definitely seems to be placed in the template of an ongoing story that needs to be explained. But don't look at me for that right now. There's still not enough content to give you a rundown. But it is certainly hitting markers of Night My material, so yes, it has my seal of approval both as a viewer and in my field of study and coverage. And I suppose that's about it. Everybody else that I follow, I've already mentioned in other videos, or they upload quite infrequently and are special channels I get around to seeing sometimes. This, however, is what most of my YouTube intake consists of outside my field. When I'm not looking at things that might end up on Nightmind, this is the stuff I enjoy putting on, and it's also some of what inspired me to even do this in the first place. Major thanks to everybody mentioned here for doing what they do and being awesome, dedicated, and wonderful creators. I'm extremely lucky to call some of you friends and lucky to have found your content. Please, never doubt the impact that you have on people or your own abilities as creators. Thank you immensely for doing what you do. And to those of you I know personally now, thank you for being my friend. Thanks of course to all of you watching for viewing and supporting as well. If you're interested in any of the channels I brought up here, do give them a view. And if you like them as much as I do, check to see if they have a Patreon. As little as just a dollar means a lot. Major thanks especially to my own Patreon supporters who help my YouTube dreams take root and grow to this point. Stick around to the end of this video to see all of their names. When I upload next, it might be a surprise on what I cover. I don't know if I'll feel compelled to cover something online between now and the next couple of weeks, or if the offline ideas will keep me working. But do know this. Your kindness, your support, and your willingness to journey with me to topics gives me new life. I feel free to grow and find my passion again. And after the busy month of October, it means a lot to feel well rested and reinvigorated so quickly. Once more, I'm Nick Nocturne, and I'll be seeing you again real soon. Sleep tight.